Father, we thank you so much. Father, thank you for giving us a reason to live. Thank you for allowing us to live in this country. Father, thank you for allowing us to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I pray this morning as we look at your word that we would be drawn into the awesomeness that is you. Father, that we might see ourselves and see you in a different light, a light that you shine on each and every one of us. Father, we have so much to be thankful for, and and yet I know we take so much for granted. I pray this morning, God, that we would allow you to penetrate to the very depths of who we are with the truth of your word, with the truth of your grace, the truth of your mercy, the awesome truth of who you are and what life is about. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated, if you will. Today is a day to remember. 15 years ago today was 9-11. Our world changed forever. And depending on who you would ask, terror won or terror lost. Depends on your perspective. The only truth that is really the truth is, is that God is sovereign over everything. And when we look at 9-11 of 2001 through the perspective of God, we have to see, if we're his children, that God is in control. He allowed something to happen that, that literally has never happened in the history of our country. And we're still reeling from it today. If you look at Facebook or you look at a lot of the social media sites this morning, there are tons and tons of Twin Tower buildings and airplanes and eagles and flags and, and crosses and hands in prayer, and we need to be praying for our country. We need to be praying for the enemies of our country, but we need to be, be, be praying for everyone, period. You know, as we reflect on... on That day, I I remember Fran calling me, and I remember it just shook our world. God wants to shake your world this morning. Not as we remember what happened, because that, unfortunately, that horrible thing is is in the past, but it might happen again. We never know. And so if you're the church, if we're believers, then our hope for the rest of this day, our hope for the rest of this week and the rest of this month and the rest of this year is in Him and in Him alone. We can't depend on ourselves. We cannot depend on on our strength, the strength of our nation, the strength of our world, the strength of our resolve, because the strength of our resolve has to come from God. And as His children, as His kids... It begins with us. I'm responsible for Ray Shirley. But you know what's easier for Ray Shirley to do? Is to be responsible for you. And to make you feel like you're responsible to me. So I can deal with you much easier than I can deal with myself because I see your flaws. I don't have any, so not. So have you ever looked in the mirror? I know. I love, I love the mirror. I hate the mirror. I have a love-hate relationship with the mirror. But you ever, have you ever really just looked in the mirror and not looked at the lines or the pimples or the blemishes or the gray, the gray hair? Or, or all, have you ever looked in the mirror and simply said, why am I here? Have you ever done that? Have you ever wondered why God placed you Today, on September 11th, 2016, at Monument Baptist Church in Grand Junction, Colorado, of all places. Have you ever looked in the mirror after you've totally blown it, you've sinned worse than you've ever sinned before, and you looked in the mirror and said, God, why am I here? See, before we can begin to, to address issues that are outside of ourselves, we have to let God deal with us. So we're going to look at a lot of Scripture this morning, because we tell everyone to go to your Bible and find the answers, right? 
We were at a Gideon luncheon yesterday, and I love the Gideon Bibles because in the back of the Gideon Bibles, they've got a lot of, of, of one scripture lines that address different issues and different questions, more than just about salvation, but about finding peace, finding hope, finding purpose. I want us this morning, since we're in a remembrance mode anyway, to remember who we are in Christ, who we are in God and what God has done for us. So I'm, the scriptures are going to be up on the screen. I'm not going to try to give them all to you because we'll be here till one and I, I'm already hungry and I'm sure you guys are too. So we're going to spend our time looking at God's word, spending more time in God's word than hearing me speak other than to read. Jeremiah had a question. Jeremiah is the great prophet of the Old Testament, and and he was struggling because the Israelites were so far from God. And God had said, you are going to be my mouthpiece. You are going to be my prophet. You are going to be my voice to a people. But Jeremiah, you've got to understand, they don't care. They're not going to listen. But you're going to tell them anyway. And so Jeremiah in chapter 20 of of Jeremiah asked this question, why did I ever come forth from the womb? Why was I born, God, if I'm going to be toiling my whole life with your blessing and not see any results of my effort? God, why did I ever come forth from the womb to look on trouble and sorrow? God, did you only plan for me to be born so that life would stink? That's, that's his mindset. God, am I only here for trouble? Am I only here for sorrow? And was it only for trouble and for sorrow and for pain? Have you ever wondered that? God, why is life so hard? Anybody ever? Am I the only one? No, here's a few. Because sometimes life is just so hard. Jeremiah finishes this thought with this verse. With this ver- These words, to look at on trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame or disgrace. God, am I here only to be disgraced? And with Jeremiah saying, Jeremiah saying that we have to come to grips with the reality that life doesn't always happen the way that we want it to happen. We don't get the results that we wish would come our way. And that if we are going to be the children of God and we're going to be effective outside these doors and inside these doors and in our world, then we have to learn what God's perspective is. And so if we doubt why we're here, and honestly, I deal with a lot of pastors and I deal with a, a lot of Christian people that feel like the 21st century has been nothing but a struggle. And it has. But God did say that we were going to toil and we were going to spin and we were going to suffer and we were, we were not destined on, on this planet and on this earth to have what heaven offers us. That this is a place of serving God, and this place where we're to serve God hates God. And if they hate God, they hate Christ, then they hate his church. So have I encouraged you yet? You know, reality should always be an encouragement. Because if you don't know where you stand, then all you get to do is guess and hope. So Jeremiah said, God, what am I doing here? Life stinks. It's all toil. It's all trouble. Solomon has an answer for that. In Proverbs chapter 16, he says, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answers of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the weight of the Lord motivates. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. God is in control. God knows what he's doing. He has got plans. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose. Do you believe that? Do you believe that September 11th, 2001 had a purpose? We have to. 
We have to believe that God is God and that God is capable and that God has a purpose and God has a plan. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So he says this, when you tie Paul, you tie um, Solomon and you tie Jeremiah together, Jeremiah says, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Solomon says, well, God, God put you here. God's got a plan for you. Everything that happens is under God's control. And then Paul says in Ephesians that we serve a blessed, glorious God who's got the whole world, all of existence in his hand. And he says, I bless you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And we are in Christ and Christ in us. The Holy Spirit stirs. We've been talking about the Trinity and all those things that, that, that the Father says he will do, that Jesus says he will do, and that the Holy Spirit will do. And the Holy Spirit resides in the heart of every believer. We are sealed. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. You're here because God wants you to be here. You're here because God chose you. Your existence is here because God allowed you to be birthed and placed in a, in a blood family. And then he blesses us by saying, you have, you have kin and they're blood kin. But I'm going to give you a spiritual family that is far more vast than your blood. Because they are mine just like you are mine and you are part of that family. And so God chose us. So so. Why am I here? I'm here because God said, I'm right here to be here. He made it possible for me to be here. He made it possible for us to be here. He allowed us to exist. And all existence is in God's hand. God is, and again, you know this is my favorite word, one of my favorite words. Idiot is one. Sovereign is the other. God is sovereignly in control of everything, including me and including you. So God, what am I here for? Why am I here? Do I even matter? Have you ever ever thought that? Have you ever said, you know, I get up and I go to work and I, you know, I do all the stuff that that I'm supposed to do in life, but God, does it really make a difference? Do I really matter? Does, Does what I do matter? Have you ever wondered that? Raise your hand. Sure. I talk to a lot of people and a lot of times... I get so frustrated because they don't do what I tell them to do. I've got this great advice. It's biblical advice. It's experiential advice. And they come to me wanting this advice, and and I give it to them, and it's free. Free is good. And then they turn around, and they do the exact exact opposite of what they were encouraged to do. And there are times when I'll look in the mirror, and I go, God, (laughs) does it even really matter? I mean, what a waste of my time. And I, have to, I deal with that. I struggle with that. Why would I invest my time in people that don't care? Why would you invest your time with people that don't care? Because God said so. Because God said that everything that you do matters. Everything that you say can change someone's life. Isaiah 49, beginning in verse 1, says, Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his, of his hand, he has concealed me. And he also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will show my glory. But I said, I have toiled in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity, yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord and my reward with my God. It's not up for us to say what the results are going to be. We don't get to weigh in on whether or not we're effective or not. You know what we get to weigh in on? 
Did I do what God led me to do? Was I obedient to what God has led me to do in speech, in behavior, and in activity? Was I faithful to the calling to be a child of God, saved from eternal damnation, to serve a God who loves me and who loves the world? See, he's got, and we used to sing this song, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the big whole world in his hands, and in this hand, he's got you too. He says, you are mine, I am yours. He's got it all in control. And he, he always has. It's never been out of his control. Isaiah 44, 2 says, uh, 1 and 2 says, But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen, thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Do not fear you've been chosen. So that was, that's what Isaiah's message was to the Israelites. God has chosen you. Well, if you're a believer, God has chosen you and you've received his offer of salvation. You are, are firmly planted in the family of God. So do what God leads you to do. Do what God's word says to do. Be obedient because that's what we're responsible for. See, when Ray is disobedient, it doesn't matter what you do because God's got to deal with me. You guys, have, you, you're responsible for yourself. But in the big picture, we're responsible to each other. We're going to get to that next week. But this week, we have to deal with self. See, if we look in the mirror and, and we're kind of like Martin Luther, remember Martin Luther, the great theologian that, that basically changed the whole scope of, of, of Christianity? He believed that, that God saved you by the power of the Holy Spirit through his grace and that it wasn't ever about works. And because he used to be a, a Catholic and he used to scourge himself and beat himself with, with a cat of nine tails and with a rod because he thought he could beat the devil out of him or beat the sin out of him. And that was the practice of the day. And in the midst of, of, of one of his self-scourgings, he, he came to the realization, I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you're just beating yourself up, but no change is going to come from beating yourself up. You need to surrender to God. You need to honor his word, and you need to be faithful in serving God. And so Martin Luther became one of the most famous theologians, one of the most famous preachers, teachers of that era. He brought about the Reformation that changed what church looks like and what Christianity looks like because he came to realize and the world came to realize that grace is from God and that he's not trying to beat us up. He's trying to love us, and that's what he does. We will be judged. We will be chastened. Don't, don't mishear me, but we don't get to do that. I remember as a kid, my brothers were horrible. They, they led me astray every single, every single time. And we would we'd be threatened. My mom was a, a, a person who loved threats. I'm going to beat you, and I'm going to beat you when we get home, and then your dad's going to come home, and he's going to beat you too. That's Roy, are you here, Roy? He's shaking his head. He's going, yeah. And so here's what we would do. We would spank ourselves until we'd cry, hoping that if we beat ourselves up enough that we would not get punished. And you know what happened? My rear end was sore from me beating my rear end. My mom beat my rear end, and it was twice as sore. And my dad beat my rear end, and it was 10 times as sore. So all I did was add, was add pain to the punishment. That's what happens when we beat ourselves up for not being who we think we should be instead of allowing God to be the one who leads us, guides us, directs us, and chastens us and disciplines us. We should be mournful. We should, we should grieve over our sin. But only by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives are we going to be changed people. And if you remember John chapter 3, you know that we're born again, so we're changed the moment we become believers and God says, You're, you, as my new creation, I am going to allow you to live life differently. So stop beating yourself up for being who you are and let me transform you into who I want you to be. 
And that's where the power of the word comes. When we look at God's word and we say, yeah, I'm horrible. I do horrible things. You do horrible things. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. But God says, I love you anyway. And in me, in Christ, I've made you worthy. See, when we allow self to explain our existence and our behavior, then we take the glory away from God who says, I will make you into a new creation. And I've made you a new creation. And I've given all that you need in this life to live a life of glory for me. Folks, that's awesome. So do you matter? Absolutely. And there's a two-sided coin here. You matter negatively and you matter positively. Because if you follow God and you obey God, then you're a blessing. It doesn't matter what the end results are. If we're obedient to God, God is going to bless that. Now, we know God works all things together for good for those who love the Lord and walk according to his purpose, right? We know that, Romans 8, 28. So this is the good part. When we're who we say we are, when we are who God saved us to be, God says, blessing, blessing, blessing. But the flip side of that coin is, is even if we're horror, horrible, terrible people that struggle constantly and God is constantly chastening us and disciplining us, then we're not receiving the blessing, but God in his word says that I'm still going to make something good come out of that. But we're the ones that, that suffer. But not only do we suffer, but you know, when we misrepresent God, when we, we misrepresent our Savior, that's a horrible thing. God says, you don't have to do that. Here's how you do it, he says. Walk with me. Walk with me. You remember the disciples? See Galilee and Jesus is walking by and he says, okay, now drop your nets, brush your teeth, comb your hair, file your nails, pack a bag, have six or seven changes of clothes. I, I want those feet shiny. I want those toenails so that they're a spotless, sp spick and span. And when you're done with all that, then I want you to just come along. Isn't that what he said? Oh, that's right. He didn't say that. He looked at Peter and he said, follow me. James and John, follow me. But hold it, they thought. I have to clean my toenails, I have to brush my teeth, I have to comb my hair. And Jesus said, follow me. That's the same response that we, we're going to get. He says, forget all of that and follow me and live for me. And all those things in your fellowship will begin to, take, to fall into place and to be as they should be. Because as you walk with me and as you live in me, your whole existence will change. Folks, that's awesome. That does not mean we're not responsible for ourselves. But here's our responsibility. Follow God. Follow his word. Follow his ways. Or spend the rest of your life with God prompt, prodding you and prompting you and making it so you want him. Because he said you get to choose. That's why it's so important that we look in the mirror, that we take a gander at ourselves and we go, Wow. I know why I'm here, because God wants me here. I know I have meaning. I know I have purpose, even if I don't see it, because my purpose is not even in my mission. My purpose is in Christ. My purpose is in God. I remember when I was in seminary, we were taught about uh, these old foreign missionaries, Judson Taylor and, and so on and so forth, and, and these guys toiled for years and years in foreign countries, and some of them never saw anyone during the, the, the tenure of their ministry ever see one person come to, come to Christ, come to salvation. They never. And some of them spent 30, 40, 50 years telling the people that Jesus saves and that God loves them, and they lived an exemplary life for Christ, and no one, to their knowledge, came to know Christ. Can you imagine the frustration? I mean, some of you aren't even 50 years old in here. Can you imagine having accomplished nothing in your life, according to your perspective? Because I didn't see anybody saved. 
here's the question. Is it about you seeing someone saved or is it about you being faithful to God and doing what he's led you to do? Are you living a life of glory for God? Because that's the only thing we're responsible for. We can't talk anyone into heaven. It's not our job. Our job is to tell them about heaven and to tell them about a Savior and to tell them about forgiveness and eternal life and grace, hope, and peace. And that's, that's the reality we have to live in. Isaiah 44, 2 again says, Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Don't fear. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Who's worried today? Nobody raised their hand. Psalm 139.16 says, For my eyes have seen, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. God knows everything that you're going to do today. He knows everything you're going to do tomorrow. He knows all there is to know about all of you. I love the Living Bible's paraphrase of this. It says, you Scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. God is in control. Period. He knows our comings, our going. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. He knows the one I have on mine. He knows all there is. Psalm 33, 11 says this, The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. He's got it all in control. That says I, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, he says. I know. Folks, God knows. And he says, I'll let you in on it when you're ready. Oh, you, you might not ever be ready. So follow me. Trust me. Walk with me. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says this, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made of hands, eternal in the heavens. God says, I am never going to leave you I am never going to forsake you. You are responsible to me for living a life of faith, and I'm going to give you the faith to live. You're, folks, we are eternal in Christ. This really, when you think about eternity and you think about our existence, this is just barely a speed bump. And yet we treat it like it's the be-all to end-all. Have you watched the Broncos games the other night? game the other night. Well, I thought there'd be more. How many of you are going to watch the Steelers play tomorrow night? <laughs> Thanks, Joe, George, Howard. See, a, a lot of times we put so much effort into those type of things than we do God's things. And we get upset. We get upset when someone doesn't stand for the national anthem. We get upset when someone is disrespectful from our perspective in dealing with whatever it might be. Or we get upset because someone doesn't receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Or we get upset because someone supports Hillary or someone supports Donald or someone supports nobody. And I got to tell you, I get to do what I want to do. You get to do what you want to do. And God says, I'll deal with you. I'll deal with you. You know, it's against the law for me to tell you who to vote for. I can't do that. And you know what? I wouldn't because I could be wrong. Because you know what I, what I would do? 
I would look at all the statistics, all of the history, all, everything that everyone has done, and I'd go, well, I think this is right. I, you know, on paper, this, this looks, oh, hold it. This, oh, man, I don't know. And so I would never in my wildest dreams say, you have to do this. But you know what? Ray's got to do something. And you know, where I get, you know where I get my answer from? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. You know that one? And from prayer and from relationship, where God says, these are my standards. This is my character. This is who I am, God says. Follow me. That's our responsibility, whether it's an election, whether it's, it's in a conversation, no matter where it is, we are to follow the principles and the character of God, period. And I know we are all going to think, yeah, but I think I know better. We would never think that. So let's not think that. God says, I've got it all in control. You honor me. And what if there's no good option? Honor God. Well, how do I do that? Well, why don't we open the word of God and see what God likes and what he dislikes? But I don't want obey the word of God. Period. Enough. Proverbs 9.6 says this. Sorry, I went on a little rant there. I, I, I'm not really apologizing. I just want you to know I realized that I did that. Proverbs 9.6 says, Forsake your folly and live, and proceed in the way of understanding. Let's see, here's, this is what the message says. I like this, this translation of it here, this paraphrase. Leave your impoverished confusion and live... Walk up the street to a life with meaning. Forget your folly. For, for, forget. Follow God. We're not ever going to get it right in this life unless God gets it right for us. Period. Forsake your folly and live. I, I, I struggle with this. Been a pastor for almost 25 years and something like that, getting close. Been a Christian for 41, 41 years. Got a lot of experience with God. But you know, I don't know it all. How many of you have been Christians more than 50 years? I'm going to, let's give them a hand. Praise God. What a blessing. But they don't know it all. They don't, and you know the great thing about it is they know they don't know it all, and they're still walking, they're still talking, they're still going forward, pressing towards the goal, as Paul says. That's what we get to do. We get to toil, and we get to, to smile, and we get to praise God, and we get to cry, and we get to laugh, and we get to live. Because if we're living in Christ and we're following God, then let me just be honest, nothing is folly. Nothing is vanity if we're doing it for God. He will bless everything if we do it for him. That is his word. So what am I doing here? What are you doing here? What, what are you here for? The psalmist asks, asks this question, why did you create us? For nothing? Can you imagine saying that? I know Jeremiah kind of said that, but the psalmist said it too. Why did you create us? God, did you create us for nothing? Verse 47 of Psalm 89 says, remember what span my life is, for what vanity you have created all the sons of men. 
there was a sense of despair. And if you've been on here on Wednesday nights, you know how awful despair is. There was a despair in the psalmist that said, God, I'm not sure it's worth it. I'm not sure I can handle what you've put before me. Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We don't get to have all the answers. We have a direction. How many of you know which direction Manhattan is? This is south, this is north, this is west, and this is east. So it's east by north, right? Okay. So what happens if you go west by north? Alaska is my home. You'll end up in Canada. You'll, you'll end up having to get a boat or get a plane to get to where you want to go because it's not the right direction. Yes, you can get there. But really, have you ever driven through Canada in the middle of winter? 20 times. It's not fun. But if I want to get to Manhattan and go to Broadway or go to some great dining place, I'm going to either get in a car or a van or bus or a plane. How about a plane? And fly. And I'll get exactly where I want to get when I want to get there. That's what happens when we surrender to God, when we submit. He says, I'm going to take you on the best path to get you where you need to be. Quit going the other direction because you're going to end up here anyway. Because he's got it all in control. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Knowing God results in total understanding as he reveals it. So do you want to know what life is all about? Follow God. Obey the word. Live a life that is pleasing to God according to his word. Colossians 1, 13 through 16 says this, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things, say this with me, is that up there? Is there one more verse, Vanessa? Nope. Okay, then I'll tell you. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things in him are held together. He's got the whole world together. Does it look like it's crazy? Well, it's not to him. Does it look like it's out of control? It's not to him. Does it look like things are just spinning down and going to swirl down as he flush the world? Not to him. He says, I'm holding it. All together. And you know what happens when we stop believing that? Then we start doubting God. And our faith is compromised because we are allowing what we think, what we feel, what we hear, what we see. And that contradicts what God's word says. And that's not a healthy place for the church to be. A healthy place for the church to be is thank you, God, for holding the world together and that I have you to hold on to. And then here's how I pray. God, please help me see a little bit more. Help me to understand a little bit more. I generally don't. But he says, in me, there, there's no doubt. 
There's no fear. When Peter was sent to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and there's a story of Cornelius, there's this little interaction that takes place in Acts chapter 10, and I want to close with this. Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Peter was telling a lost world that weren't Hebrews that had no idea of who God was, if you trust God and you surrender your, your life to God, then the world is your oyster because you're in Christ you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and that he loves you, and that he rose again, and that he defeated death, he defeated Satan, then you are born again, you have new life in Christ, and he offers you himself, and he welcomes everyone. Folks, that's the good news. You know what the good news is? I can only do what I can do, right? Right? You can only do what you can do. And here's the reality. It's never going to be enough. Never. And honestly, we have to say, thank you, Lord. Because if I can do it, then God doesn't get the glory. Not the way he should. So here's what he does. He says, Ray, I'm going to allow you to get to the end of your road, the end of your rope the end of your strength, the, the end of your education, the end of your knowledge, the end of your experience. And if you are following me, if you're serving me, then you will see me work in you and through you and do things that are impossible to, for anyone to conceive. But my word will never return void. And a life that is committed to me will always be of value. And the reward for that is that God's will will be done. I'm going to ask if you'll stand with me this morning. And I... I want you to think this and, and pray this. God, will, will your will be done in my life today? Will, my, will your will be done in my life today? And then say, say this, Lord, please make your will done in my life today so that I know that you are in control. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word Father, I know we used so much scripture, scripture this morning, but Lord, we, we look at your word and we see all these different people that, that were real people that lived real lives and had struggles and doubts and fears and, and even were caught up in despair and, and Lord, just felt like they were hopeless. So God, this morning, I pray that we would see ourselves through the lens of your word through the reality of our salvation if we're born again, if we truly have given our lives to Christ. And Lord, may we surrender all that we are to you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're gonna sing hymn 275. The words will be on the screen. The music is in your bulletin on a sheet. And it's simply, I surrender all, all to thee. Lord, I surrender. All to thee I freely give. So let's sing that and do what God's telling you to do. Do what he's telling you. Just be faithful because that's all we can do is be faithful. Let's sing.